when I, you know, told some of my conspiracy theorist friends, you know, like I asked them what 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 would they want me to bring up? Understandably, you know, unsurprisingly, uh, the topic that that came up is that they they want to they, they don't trust big pharma. Yeah, you know, they think they think pharma is is for profit. Yep. And and because they're for profit, um, you know, they're they're under a fiduciary obligation to their shareholders. They don't have our best interests in mind. Um, how, how do you think about big pharma and and the role they play, especially in the context of the COVID vaccine, for example? Yeah, um, conflicted <laughs> is the answer. I'm talking to Dr. Perry Wilson. Um, Perry is the author of a recent book, How Medicine Works and When It Doesn't: uh, Learning Who to Trust to Get and Stay Healthy. Um, and, uh, yeah, Dr. Wilson, this was, this was such a wonderful book. Um, how are you doing today? I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Great. Um, I'm, I'm in touch with a lot of, uh, COVID conspiracy theorists. It's something that is a, is okay. a topic I find very interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know, to some extent I've learned that you can't really reach certain people and, and, and that's okay. But what I think, what I think we can do is, is sort of talk about our experiences. You know, um, I'm, my wife is a doctor. Um, and I was married to her when she was in medical school. I lived on a medical school campus for all those years. Um, many of my closest friends are doctors. Um, and I think there's a certain experience that people in the medical profession have around COVID, an understanding of what COVID is and what COVID meant. Um, and I think a lot of people just don't have that knowledge or experience. And so I was wondering if you'd be able to share sort of from your experience, you know, what, what COVID was like for you, what stays with you from that experience, um, what you saw, things like that. Yeah, thanks for asking. We, um, it, it's rare that we actually get to kind of go back and talk about it. Um, but I, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, yeah, we should remember what it was like back when everything got started. So in April of 2020, so this was just as kind of things were initially crashing on the shores of the East Coast of the United States. Um, I was uh, sent to be a general medicine attending on a COVID ward in at Yale New Haven Hospital where I work. So I'm a nephrologist by training. I mean, I'm internal medicine board certified, but I'm a kidney doctor usually. But everyone had to do something, you know, and we were all sort of overwhelmed. So there was this ward. Everyone on the ward had COVID. It was not locked. It was not negative pressure. All those rooms had already been taken by patients with COVID. So you would, you'd walk in and you had your one N95 mask that you had to use for a week or so. You had one gown. Um, and it was really terrifying because at the time, what did we know? We knew that it was this new virus that had was this the first time it ever had been in human beings, as far as we could tell. We knew that it behaved really strangely, um, which is to say that it was very difficult to predict who would have bad outcomes. So with every other infectious disease, it's like, yeah, you know, the old people who are kind of sicker to begin with do worse. And 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 although broadly that was true with COVID, um, we kept seeing these young, healthy people, you know, crash uh, with the virus. And so my ward was not an intensive care unit ward. It was a regular hospital ward. And so I would leave at the end of the day and I'd kind of, you know, be check on every, everyone before I left. And then I knew I'd come in the next day and some of the 30 people on the ward would be in the ICU, you know, usually three or four overnight would go. And it was so hard to predict. I remember one night there was a guy who's 90 something years old and he was on a few liters of oxygen. And I was like, oh man, you know, this is not going to go well. Um, and there was a 35 year old guy in the room next door who seemed fine on a little bit of oxygen, a little bit of cough and fever hanging out. And I came in the next morning and the 95 year old guys sitting there reading a newspaper, breathing room air. And the 35 year old went to the intensive care unit overnight. I mean, that's how quickly it happened. We just didn't know what we were dealing with. We were changing our clothes in the garage, you know, so we wouldn't expose our families. We didn't really know what it would do to kids. That was still kind of out there at the time. So it was really terrifying. Um, and we had mortality rates, uh, you know, in the hospital that were north of 10%, you know, which is really serious. Um, so when we experienced all that and went through all that and then saw people, the, you know, saying that like COVID's not real or they're, they're just saying people have COVID to, to bill more or something like that. Yeah. It was very frustrating because it was so um, disconsonant from our lived experience. Um, and also just like demonstrably provably false. Like if you actually, many of many hospitals are nonprofits, including my own. If you, if you actually look at their profit and loss statements during the COVID pandemic. I mean, it was a disaster and yeah. it's a disaster in part. I'll, I'll give the, the sort of skeptics of medicine some credit. 
COVID was a disaster because medicine doesn't make money on hospitalizing people with infectious diseases. Hospitals make money based on elective surgery, joint replacements, knee replacements, and all that stuff went away during COVID. It was a terrible thing for hospitals, far from like a boondoggle. So um, yeah, it's a little frustrating, but um, as you know, as I sort of try to, to, to work through in the book, part of the reason there these conspiracy theories arise and why people are so distrustful of medicine is because, not because we're evil and are trying to kill or depopulate the planet, but because we have failed people in some fundamental ways. Um, we, we are not doing a good job in several important areas um, and people are understandably frustrated with that. Yeah. And we, we're going to, yeah, we're going to talk about that. And that I think is, you know, part of what makes your book, I think, so honest and so interesting and, and so important. And um, yeah. And, and I think a lot of what you said is it's just good for people to know, you know, and good for people to hear. Um, I think the experience of doctors and, and medical professionals, including nurses, um, people who were, were on the front lines of that, uh, I think often just gets, um, you know, uh, ignored or, or just isn't, isn't heard. Yep. Um, and yeah, just from my own circle of people, you know, I've heard stories that are very similar to yours stories of, you know, um, you know, residual trauma, you know, from, <laughs> from sort of what, what doctors, uh, saw and, and the kind of, um, stresses they were under. And yeah, I think, I think that, that just important to be aware of, you know, the, the, the humanity of the doctors as well. Um, and, and, you know, doctors like don't go into this job to put their lives on the line. And a lot of, you know, older people really felt and often did, you know, put their lives on the line to treat patients. Um, yeah, and, uh, yeah. there's a recent study um, looking at the excess mortality risk in physicians during the COVID pandemic. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I forget what their final number was, but, you know, was, uh, across the, the, the system they were looking at or the, the, the United States, I suppose it was, it was something like a thousand excess physicians died, you know, beyond what you would expect given our you know, ages and demographics and whatnot. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that's almost entirely attributable to COVID infections. Yeah. Um, okay. You mentioned our, our, our medical system, our, the, the, the people, the frustration that we have, you know, with our medical system. And, and that's something that I, like you, you said, and, you know, uh, I, I can echo the book, the book deals with very, uh, very thoroughly, um, as someone who's been on the consumer end of the medical system, um, me and everyone else I know who's been on the consumer side of the medical system uh, can attest to uh, challenges and frustrations and 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 feeling let down and and you know uh, insurance not covering things that you think would be covered and and on and on. Um, you 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 tell a story though in the beginning of your book, uh, which is just such a a great, captivating, illustrative story um, about a woman who came in to see you. Um, I think when you were a young doctor mm -hmm. and uh, she, she, you felt like she wasn't helped by the medical system. Yeah. So this was a patient I saw in a, in my resident clinic when I was at the university of Pennsylvania. And it, it was like this West Philadelphia kind of gritty clinic, uh, primary care. And this lady came in um, from the main line outside of Philadelphia. It's like the fancy area, which was just unusual on the face, of, on the face of it in this, in this clinic, but you know, whatever, there it is. And I, I, I walked into the room to see her for the first time and she just seemed angry. Like that was the emotion radiating from her before I even said a word, not like sad, frightened, unsure, like angry. Um, and so I tried to do my best and kind of listen to what was going on. And basically what she told was a story of kind of profound fatigue, um, um, you know, uh, difficulty with motivation, uh, difficulty with appetite, um, uh, sort of dissociation in some cases from family reality. And she'd been to doctor after doctor after doctor, and no one had been able to help her. Um, and she got through all these tests. There's blood tests and pregnancy tests and scans and things, and everything's negative. Everything's turning up normal. And I'm sort of listening to this and thinking to myself, hmm, like a lot of these symptoms are consistent with major depression, which does not always present as, you know, crying and you know, tearfulness, like the, it, it's a, it's a complex syndrome, um, with some, you know, possible treatments that could help. And I sort of brought this up as a possibility. And I just like saw in her face, the moment I said depression, it was like gone, like any connection between us was destroyed at that point. Um, 
whether it's the stigma, whether it's the judgment associated with it, whether I hadn't listened enough to the problems, I'm not sure. But like we finished the visit and I just, I made a follow-up appointment and I knew she wasn't coming back. I just sort of felt that way and she didn't. Um, and that would be not an unusual story and probably not worthy of being the introduction to the book, um, except for the fact that like a year goes by and I'm in the emergency room and a woman comes in seizing, you know, having a seizure. Um, and it was her, it was this, this, this woman. And we got the seizure stopped, did the tests and her, her blood sodium was super low. That was the cause of the seizure. And the, the, there are not too many ways to make your blood sodium super low, but one way, which is the way that she did is to drink an incredible amount of water. You have to drink enough water to essentially overcome your kidney's ability to excrete the water, and that dilutes the sodium enough to cause a seizure. Um, gallons and gallons of water for a healthy person. But she'd been on this water cleanse um, because in her search for answers, she had eventually found a practitioner, not a medical doctor, but a practitioner who told her that she had... Um, uh, heavy metal poisoning, heavy metal toxicity. And there was no lab evidence to, to, to prove this. She was not, ex she didn't work a, she wasn't in a profession that like has exposure to heavy metals, you know, an industry worker or anything like that. Um, so this would be very unlikely, but nevertheless, it provided, I think for her like this, something to attach to. And she really, it turned out, I'd find out later, like dove into this community that is formed online about heavy metal poisoning and toxicity and they're sharing treatments with each other and they're incredibly supportive of each other all these things that we're not good at in medicine creating communities helping people you know find answers they had built themselves it just happened to be around this kind of non-scientific thing or this thing that didn't have evidence and of course it illustrates the danger right that like she pursued a line of therapy that could have killed her, um, unfortunately didn't. Interestingly, when I went to see her after all this happened and, and had resolved, but she was still in the hospital, she was told me she's as happy as she'd ever been. Like she, no regrets. There was no, there was no, nothing about like, oh man, I shouldn't have, you know, done that water cleanse. It was like, I found the answer. I'm doing so much better now. And it is a story I'll never forget because although I don't kind of agree with my scientific side of my brain that that was the appropriate diagnosis and treatment for that patient. Nevertheless, that community that we would call fringe or conspiracy or whatever, um, got her to a place where she was suffering less than I could get her to. And it was not ideal because she nearly died. I'm not saying this is a good thing that people should do, but it does show how when we fail, um, there are other people out there that will fill the void and not always for the best reasons. Yeah. Yeah. And failure falling short can mean a lot of different things. I mean, we, we talk about, you know, ways in which the system in America, I think is uniquely troubled. Um, but there's also certain paradoxes that are just inherent in the nature of modern medicine. Um, the sense in which when you're dealing with the hard science and you want your treatment to be evidence-based and you want to be able to treat a very large number of people um, there, there is a sense in which, um, the, 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 that kind of personal, psychological, um, old timey parent, uh, patient doctor relationship, um, is much less, uh, applicable, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, doc, doc, doctors are sort of trained, uh, and I, and I, I discuss this, um, as, as sort of one of the secrets of medicine that they don't tell you, but like doctors are trained to treat populations. Right. Um, you know, if, I have a thousand patients that I see who have high blood pressure. Um, I can know pretty, pretty accurately that if I treat all a thousand with a certain blood pressure lowering drug, I will avoid, let's say 20 heart attacks and Hey, that's 20 less heart attacks in the world. And I would feel good about that on a population basis. And I wouldn't be wrong because we should be trying to reduce heart attacks in the population. But if you think about it from the perspective of one of those thousand people, right? I treated a thousand. There's a thousand people taking an extra drug a day and 909, 980 of them, am I doing my math right? 980 of them 
aren't deriving the benefit from that. The problem is I don't know who the 20 people I'm going to save are before I treat the whole thousand. I All I know is that, you know, these thousand people have this general set of risk factors. And so it's that tension between population-based medicine, which is what a doctor is kind of doing, and individualized medicine, which is what should interest a patient themselves, where like trust breaks down between patients and doctors. And doctors are like, why aren't you taking this medication I prescribed for you? You know, this is a good evidence-based medication, but it still may not be right for you. And it's important that doctors start to understand that their treatments, while good on average, don't work in every person. In fact, they really only work on the margins. It's just that it's hard to define where the margins are. Yeah, I think you just sort of revealed like a major spoiler, like one of the climaxes <laughs> of your book, you know, this idea that there is a there is a conspiracy in modern medicine. Um, there's, there's something that, that that you're not told really as a patient. And it's this yeah. idea that medicine is designed to treat populations of people. Um, and I think, quote, as, as you say it, you know, the chances are the med this is a quote, chances are the medication you are taking isn't going to help you, yeah. you know, and that's a very stark way to put it. Um, <laughs> right. But but. It might. And and so the thing, the the, the sort of analogy is um, I often talk about, I think I, I think this is there too, the seatbelt. Mm -hmm. So you wear a seatbelt, most of us, I hope everyone should wear their seatbelt, right? Um, we wear our seatbelts because we know, and this is true, that if you get in a bad accident, the seatbelt is likely to save your life. The truth though, is that most of us don't get in life-threatening car accidents. That Most of us don't die of car accidents. That's good. We die of other things, which isn't good, but most of us don't die of car accidents. Most of us are going to wear that seatbelt our entire life. And we might get in a fender bender. We might even get in an accident where we would not have died. But the vast, vast majority of us wearing that seatbelt every single day that we drive for our entire lives will not have our life saved by that seatbelt. We could have gone the whole time without a seatbelt and been fine. Now, we do it anyway. Because first of all, we might be that person that does get saved. And because wearing your seatbelt costs nothing and is easy and is a habit, we do it. And that's fine because, you know, why not? It's a, If someone handed you a lottery ticket, you wouldn't throw it away because the chances are low that you'll win. You'd say, oh, thanks. That's great. Free lottery ticket. Fingers crossed. Um, and medicine works similarly. I mean, the chances are way better than a lottery ticket that it's going to benefit you. But we do have to be honest that... Um, any single medical intervention has a relatively low chance, but not zero, of saving your life. But now if we think about all the medical interventions we do, all those lottery tickets that a patient buys, the chance that one of them is going to make the difference gets higher and higher. So it might not be that one pill, that blood pressure medication I prescribe, but maybe it's the cholesterol medication I prescribe. Maybe it's the fact that you're getting, you know, five days of, of, of exercise a week. Maybe it's uh, that you cut saturated fat out of your diet. You don't know which of these interventions is going to make a difference. And on their own, very few of them seem to change very much. We are, we, the destiny is powerful, but together they do. And that's this idea of like, there's no one way, there's no one simple thing. That's another theme of the book. There's no, you know, one way to avoid cancer. There's no one way to lose stubborn belly fat. There's no one way to like ensure a happy marriage. All of these things take multiple investments across multiple different domains of health um, to just try to hedge your bets to get the best possible outcome. Yeah. And probably some of the bo the most beneficial uh, lifestyle changes of living a healthy lifestyle, eating well, um, are are not focused on so much by the medical profession. It, certainly, in the, the standard sort of doctor patient encounters that we have that are you know often very short, um, because they're just not they're not sort of in the purview of you know standard uh, you know medical procedure practice. You know. Yeah, I mean, part of it's that. I mean, you know, a lot of doctors will say like, "Hey, are you getting some exercise?" You know, and pat you on the back. But um, but it the it's hard to prescribe. Um, yeah. I mean, there've actually been some really interesting studies that show that if a doctor actually writes on a prescription pad, like 30 minutes of exercise, five days a week, that as opposed to just telling the patient that they'll do it more so that there is some kind of psychological That's great. power That's of a wonderful. prescription. <laughs> yeah. So maybe, so ask your doctor for a prescription for exercise, but, um, um, I, you know, one reason that medicine and now I'm lowercase medicine, like pills are, the centerpiece of our modern healthcare system are really because they're quite easy. Now, you know, no one likes taking pills and, be, and remembering taking pills, but, you know, 
taking that one pill I take in the morning is way easier than getting myself to the gym um, and doing, you know, 30 minutes of cardio. Um, even though the cardio is no doubt way, way better for me than that one pill. And so there's this tendency to kind of focus on, on the easy pills are low hanging fruit. I can write your prescription. It sits in your medicine chest. If you're, you know, you got an app on your phone to remind you to take it, you take it. That's a relatively simple thing that doesn't require you to change your life very much at all, particularly if you're already taking other pills, it really doesn't require much change on your part, but it turns out time and time again, that the things that have a really significant impact on your future risk it are things are changing. You have to change what's in yourself, whether it's, you know, th these lifestyle changes, things that are hard, things that are uncomfortable. You know, I don't like running. Um, well, run until you start liking it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's hard. Okay, coming back to, to sort of the overarching sort of themes of the book, I think we talked about, you know, this big secret in medicine. And I think a, a big theme of the book is just being honest with people yeah. about the nature of medicine and trying to sort of pull back um, you know, like, like no, no, there's no secrets here. You talk a lot about mistakes and you talk a lot about, um, uh, drugs that have been prescribed to people and procedures that have been used that, that are, that weren't helpful. Um, and there's a sense of, you know, now maybe more than ever, it feels like we live in a time where that level of trust between the medical establishment and, and the general population seems to be really, um, frayed. Uh, and, and you talk about other ways in which that, that trust, um, is, is challenged. You know, one is, one is just, a the nature of our, our system where, um, you know, a doctor might prescribe a drug and the patient finds that the drug is not covered by insurance and that the cost is unaffordable, you know, and that's, that's a very, um, you know, troubling experience. And I, I know people yeah. who've, you know, had experiences like that, you know, of course. um, and, and I have doctor friends who've know that experience very well. Um, and access, you know, not everyone has, I think access equally, certainly, you know, um, uh, Again, it depends on place to place, state to state, you know, and, and, and lots of different factors. But I think a lot of people feel cut out um, in some ways economically because of our, our, our the nature of our healthcare system, um, the way in which, you know, our, our insurances are tied to our work and things like 100%. that. You, you, and you see public health officials, you know, whenever anything is a little bit vague, right? So um, to, to use uh, maybe a controversial example, but one that I think is relevant, um, should an otherwise healthy 18-year-old man get a fourth booster vaccine? All right. So now there's public health messaging here, which is designed to be simple, right? People need a simple message that you can repeat over and over and over again, and they can hear it because it is good for the population. Again, population-based health. And it's very simple to say like, yep, everyone should get vaccinated. They're safe. You know, it's, it's beneficial. And this is true. <laughs> I'm not a vaccine skeptic. This is true. They do save lives. However, we know there's some risk, for example, for of, of myocarditis. And we know that if you've already been vaccinated and perhaps had an infection or two and gotten boosted that, you know, the marginal benefit of that extra booster may or may not be worth it. I mean, the truth is we don't have great data one way or another to tell you exactly how protected that 18 year old would be with a new booster versus not a new booster. And this is a situation where public health figures, when they know there's a little bit of vagary in the data, have two choices. Number one, ignore the vagaries in the data and just close your eyes and say, you know what, everyone do the thing. Now I get the motiv the motivation to do this because it's simple and you do want people to get vaccinated and, and you don't want the 50 year old who really should get vaccinated to hear what you're saying to the 18 year old and think it extrapolates to them. So you worry about all those off target effects. Your other choice is to do this line where you say like, well, it's complicated. You should talk it over with your doctor. And that's sort of the like escape clause um, for, for a lot of, you know, we don't know what's going on in medicine. And that's also true because it allows individualized medicine. The problem is, who is my doctor? Like, what percentage of people, particularly young people, um, otherwise healthy people, but even, you, you know, even people who are quite sick but disadvantaged have inadequate insurance or are uninsured, like they don't have a doctor to talk this over with at all. Um, they don't have a primary care physician. They could call maybe somewhere and maybe get an appointment that's seven months away. Um, and that means that there isn't even an opportunity 
to have that like nuanced discussion about the benefits and risks of any given intervention. You can't, you're not even in the room. And so we've got to solve that infrastructure problem first before we can even say like, let's help people make better medical decisions. Like, what are you talking about? They don't even know who their doctor is. They don't even have a phone number for them. Yeah. And another piece of this, of this equation, which, which your book deals with, and again, it's something which is very, very apparent to me in, in my life, as I'm sure just to everyone who is near adjacent to the medical profession, is the way in which doctors are often very overtaxed and very overworked. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and there's a lot of factors that go into that, you know, who's, you know, who, who owns the, the clinics, who owns the hospital and, and things like that, um, and just supply demand issues. Um, but it's, it's hard to, you know, I, I, my experience is that doctors are heroic, that, you know, going above and beyond to sort of generate uh, meaningful relationships with patients um, when they are incredibly squeezed for time. And they often, you know, are working from a position of having a backlog of, of people waiting in the waiting yeah. room, you know, um, and just just the, the just the way our, the structure of our system is set up um, and being one that that, you know, is not conducive um, for, for trust in the institution of medicine these days. Yeah. And, and just so everyone knows, none of us like this. <laughs> one of the things I'm trying to get out is like doctors and patients are on the same side. Like we need to fight together against these structural issues that we hate and you hate. Um, 70 percent of physicians in the United States are employees of health systems. So it's this vision of like doctors as, you know, a private, as like a, as a small business owner. Right. Like some of they hang out their shingle and they're providing a service to the community. 70% of doctors are labor, not management. And yet they don't think of themselves that way yet. Um, they're not seeing the dissatisfaction they have with their jobs, like being forced to see 50 patients in a day, you know, five minute visits, not being able to build those connections, getting underpaid for that important work, like preventative yep. medicine, and when like seeing colleagues get overpaid for elective surgeries and things like that. They don't understand that that is a classic management labor problem. They view it as, I don't know, as like some like weird, unique thing, but it's not. It's just exploitation of labor at the hands of management. And I, I'm not trying to sound like revolutionary here, but I want to put this in terms that there's like a, a long history of how to resolve these issues. <laughs> and part of that for doctors and, and what I hope to some extent, like me talking about this openly starts is a discussion about how we can push back against the people who are managing our time on behalf of our patients and with our patients at our side, because I think together, like doctors and patients together, um, you know, fighting against a system that's making care worse for everyone can actually have a pretty, a pretty dramatic impact. Yeah. And your book talks about solutions. I mean, to me, the solution that's always seemed obvious uh, as someone who has family around the world is just a single payer system. I mean, that's, yep. that's always <laughs> just made the most sense to me. Yeah. Um, but what what comes to mind to you when you think about, you know, simple, uh, available solutions? Yeah, I mean, cer certainly the fact that we're the only industrialized nation without a single peri healthcare system and that every other industrialized nation seems to have made it work suggests like there is a way to make it work. Um, so it's not like magic. It is, though, I think, politically untenable um, I and in this country. Um, maybe that will change. You know, we can underestimate how fast the political winds can change in this country. Um, uh, you know, and sometimes just a movement goes and things happen. Um, but this one is a tough lift. Um, what I see as a middle ground, um, this is going to get a little wonky, but is is a model called all pair rate setting. Um, and the idea behind all pair rate setting is that you have a centralized um, uh uh, bureaucracy that dictates how much various medical procedures, things should cost. So that an EKG, an interpretation of the EKG costs the same, regardless of what insurance you have, or even if you're uninsured and you're just getting billed out of pocket. Um, and there can be adjustments for the local, you know, cost of living and stuff like that. You know, there's statistics here, but basically there's an imposition. Um, what this does is, first of all, it eliminates a huge amount of waste in the system that is occurring because, I mean, mo many people don't know this, that each health system is negotiating all the time, continuously more or less, with each insurance carrier over the price of each service they provide. It's crazy. So you have like 
tons of people on all sides constantly negotiating and trying to get one up on each other. It's an incredibly difficult system to manage. It's why there are 10 administrators for every physician in the American healthcare system, 10 to one, it's insanity. And so eliminating just that would cause a dramatic increase in efficiency in the system. Um, the other thing it does is it levels the playing field for people that either don't have insurance or are underinsured um, and lets them choose, you know, they're going to get the care they need for a price that is widely available, widely transparent, and is, you know, covered um, equally by any private insurance carrier. Now, it doesn't it doesn't eliminate private insurance, but that may be viewed as a good thing because, you know, it's an industry. They have they've got jobs and stuff like that. And the question, of course, is, OK, well, then how does insurance companies compete for you? Like, how do they compete between, you know, how does that compete with Cigna and whatnot if the costs are fixed? And the answer is service. You know, um, they, they're they are going to have to provide better quality of care, better matching of patients to doctors, facilitate, um, facilitate, uh, facilitating visits, home, home care, lab testing, like it'll open up the ability to compete on all these sort of um, things that we don't usually think about now because we're so obsessed with, you know, what the price of a drug or a procedure is. So there's actually a state that does this. Maryland does all pair rate setting. And, and despite being one of the most expensive states to live in in the country, it has one of the cheapest health insurance uh, rates of the country. So it does work. Yeah, it's it's um, in some ways, in some ways it feels attainable. In some ways it feels like it's, just, it's you know, the, the solutions are there. You know, yeah, yeah. On, on the yeah. other hand, you know, we're coming off of a, a political cycle where we were, you know, one Senate vote away from repealing the Affordable Care Act and, mm -hmm. you know, throwing millions of people off their health insurance. And so it just it feels things feel very, um, yeah, very volatile and, and um, uh, scary, I would say. Um, yeah. In a lot of yeah. Ways. And we're so disconnected from each other, too. I mean, this gets back to the kind of themes of social isolation and loneliness that I think are kind of the meta problems that our society faces right now that you know, you could probably throw, you know, it's a country of 350 million people, you could probably throw 30 million people off of their health insurance. And like, as devastating as that is for those 30 million people, you know, many of us might not know a single one of them. Um, and, and it's like, we don't feel the suffering of the other people in the country. Um, and it makes it really easy to get complacent and just worry about, you know, worry about ourselves. Like, am I taken care of? Is my family taken care of? If yes, then I, this is not an issue that I'm going to be motivated about. I'm going to get angry about other things. And obviously political parties are really good at giving us other things to get angry about when, you know, arguably the ability of the state to care for its citizens should be like kind of the number one, you know, requirement for government. Yeah. Um, when I, uh, when I, you know, told some of my conspiracy theorist friends, you know, like I asked them what, what, what would they want me to bring up? Understandably, you know, unsurprisingly, uh, the topic that, that came up is that they, they want to, they, they don't trust big pharma. Yeah. You know, they think, they think pharma is, is for profit yep. and, and because they're for profit, um, you know, they're, they're under a fiduciary obligation to their shareholders. They don't have our best interests in mind. Um, how, how do you think about big pharma and, and the role they play, especially in the context of the COVID vaccine, for example? Yeah, um, conflicted <laughs> is the answer. So, um, yeah, pharma is for profit um, and uh, they want to make as much money as possible. Totally true. Um, that is the case for most businesses and industries in America. And yet, you know, we don't necessarily feel the same way about, you know, our local grocery store um, or even the gas station, although we get kind of angry about the price of gas, it doesn't engender the same like rage that pharmaceutical um, uh, profit motives make. And I think it's because we consider health secretly a human right that like even people who don't think that health you know, being healthy as a human right um, might somehow deep in the darkest recesses of their soul feel that that's true. And therefore um, trying to profit off that is immoral. Um, and I sympathize with those feelings where it, where the kind of cognitive bias enters 
is when you decide that because a pharmaceutical company is motivated by profit, they are therefore that their drugs therefore do not work or or potentially, as I've heard some conspiracy theorists talk, are designed to hurt you. Right. Um, and that's just not true. In fact, I was speaking with a pharmaceutical executive once who was being candid with me and I won't name names, but um, who said like, yeah, like we're for profit. And the best way I can make a profit is to have a drug that really works well. You know, they loved Viagra, like they made a ton of money on that. And, you know, ask around it. It it works. It's not fake. <laughs> you know, um, my example you know, that I use for this with the students often with the medical students is um, is epinephrine. So, right. You've got severe peanut allergy, right? Anaphylaxis to peanuts. Epinephrine injection is life-saving therapy. You don't get it, you die. Um, you get it, you live when you're exposed to peanuts. It works. It is the very definition of a medicine that works and it costs a couple bucks to make. And of course, many of you will be familiar with how the patent or the license to, to market epinephrine was bought by Mylan Pharmaceuticals. That's Martin Shkreli, yep. um, the pharma bro, you know, subsequently jacked up the price by 500, 600%. And it's despicable and it's disgusting and it's clearly for profit. Doesn't change the fact that epinephrine works for anaphylaxis. So that's the only place where I sort of like get off the conspiracy train to some extent is like, yeah, they are for profit. That's bad. I'd like to see, I'd like to see changes certainly in how we pay for drugs and to limit profitability of pharmaceutical companies and to get access to people who need life-saving drugs. Cause I do think that healthcare is a human right. Um, I just don't think that because they're designed as for-profit corporations, it means their drugs don't work any more than I think that because my supermarket is for profit that like the cantaloupes don't taste good. Like I can be upset at what they cost, but like, it's still a cantaloupe. It's and, and it's in their best interest to have a good cantaloupe actually. Exactly. Right. Like, as you're saying, I mean, uh, people have to buy the product, right? The medical yeah. establishment has to. Yeah, it was, and, and, it's yeah. not to say that they're not trying to like, you know, um, uh, to, to, to put lipstick on a pig from time to time, you know, they're, they're, they've got commercial, you know, the United States is one of two countries in the world where you can actually market prescription pharmaceuticals to the public. And there are certainly, you know, um, uh, there's actually a recent study. This is fascinating. Came out after the book was um, was is submitted, but um, it looked at advertising spending from pharmaceutical companies to consumers versus the efficacy of the drug in the pivotal trial. And basically, the less effective the drug was, the more the advertising money went up. Right. right. So, so a drug that's just a blockbuster, like works incredibly well like you don't have to spend that much money advertising you know you like <laughs> it'll get out there there's demand for that but certainly there are marginal drugs which although yes they pass the standard for safety and efficacy like all drugs in the united states have to do maybe they're not you know god's gift um and you'll see a lot of ads for that so they're they're definitely trying to do their best um to to shine everything up for you um, but again, it doesn't mean that like they're trying to kill you, that there's nanobots in the vaccine, that there's a depopulation program that certain that, you know, they have the cure for cancer, but they're not telling you to sell chemotherapy. Like all of those things come from our distaste for what is essentially a byproduct of, you know, a capitalist industry. We have that distaste and we want to translate that. It makes us angry. It makes us emotional. So we, do, we translate that into multiple other domains. And then that's how that's why the conspiracy feels right, because it seems evil that they're charging that much for epinephrine. And if they could charge that much for epinephrine, like, like, why couldn't they be, you know, creating a clone army of, you know, human pig hybrids, right? Like it's, on, it's on a scale. And so there's some truthiness to it. Yeah. And, and also people, I think, don't understand the processes in place for um, in regulation and and for testing the efficacy and mm -hmm. safety of, of our you know products. I mean, you find an airplane. The reason you know these airplanes are allowed to fly is because the government you know regulatory bodies have tested these things. FAA for safety. Um, air, and any new airplane that goes on the market has to go through a whole bunch of uh, you know safety tests and, yeah. and redundancies and everything. And, and the reason that when I buy a car seat, I trust that it's actually going to work for my protecting my kid is because it's been tested. And there's government agencies and regulatory bodies in charge of making sure that this is actually effective and safe. Um, yeah, and yeah, safe yeah. everything, the food that we eat, you know, and yeah, so I, I think, think a lot people of people would be uh, in, in, in for some hurt if, you know, all of a sudden we went like full deregulation and, and just like libertarian style capitalism, like, you know, no one inspecting anything like all it would be a rough trip to that same supermarket, right? You, you come out with salmonella. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, we take it for granted, you know. Yeah. Like I think one of the, one of the things that work against against the vaccines is how effective they are. Um, we don't, you know, we don't remember uh, what what it was like uh, when there was polio in this country, mm. um, and uh, you know, all sorts of uh, you know, mumps and measles and rubella and all Chicken these pox, things. Yeah, yeah, in my and, lifetime, uh, yeah, right, and 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 we forget, you know, how much of a of a lifesaver it is in the same way we we're, we forget, you know, the the role that. Uh, so much of the modern world has, you know, shielded shielded us from. Oh, right. I mean, yeah, it wasn't too long ago, a hundred years or so ago, where when the when infectious disease was a greater cause of death than non-infectious disease. And, you know, there, there's two reasons for why non-infectious diseases are the leading cause of death. Now, first of all, overall death rates are dramatically lower, but we've eliminated deaths from infectious disease, one, through antibiotics, but two, through vaccination programs. Yeah. All right, your your book is a little bit. It goes into the weeds of uh, when it comes to the the math of um, you know these the safety trials and and what it means uh-huh. for a drug to be considered effective. Um, you have you have a YouTube channel where you uh, take look at you know modern scientific news and you look at the data. Um, and you know you were joking with me earlier how it's not like the most uh, how would you say like like viral kind of content. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you, can you reflect on that? <laughs> Um, yeah, social media, my sort of thesis on social media and, and, and why it's kind of a problem is that um, extreme views get rewarded on social media, and yet um, extreme views are almost always wrong. <laughs> so um, it's like if you want to get, you know, retweeted or shared or like go viral on YouTube or whatever, um, and let's say we're talking about vaccines, your your options are you can either say, the, the vaccines are the single greatest scientific discovery in the past hundred years and is responsible for saving, you know, a hundred million lives and will change the world forever. And it's going to go on to cure cancer and everything else. Um, or you can say that they are, you know, um, uh, government sterilization shots. And, and like both of those takes get like a lot of, a lot of engagement. Um, But the truth about certainly medical research, I mean, I'm not an expert in other areas, and and that's another problem is people like trying to speak about areas which they're not experts in. But in the area that I'm an expert in, in medical research, um, you know, there's no no one study is ever is ever sufficient to make a firm conclusion about anything, much less an extreme conclusion. And so my YouTube channel is very much like, well, here's what the data shows. And generally I come down on the side of like, yeah, this seems pretty promising or like, yeah, I'm not, yeah, probably this isn't great, you know? And like, it's these kind of moderate takes, which I think are accurate that just, you know, it's not what social media is designed for. No one's like, holy cow, listen to what this guy says. He thinks that like, there's a chance that with future studies and replication, that this thing might be a useful drug in the next five to 10 years. Years. Yes. Uh, so I, I just to just give an example, I think I think if people want a, a complete explanation of um, what's going on uh, in this in this comic, which I'm going to cite, uh, they can they can read your book. Uh, your book deals with this. But to share with you an, uh, an XKCD of mine, uh, which is an online comic uh, that, that your book sort of yeah. evoked for me. Yeah. It's number 882. <laughs> I'll put it up on the screen. But uh, the, the main character, like, you know, Cue Ball and, and Megan, they, they say, you know, we think uh, jelly beans cause acne. So they tell the scientists to go investigate. So the scientists investigate and they said, we found no link between jelly beans and acne. P greater than 0.05. They said, so they said, okay, that settles it. They said, wait a second, what if a, a color of jelly bean causes acne? So then they say, you know, please, you know, study every color of jelly bean. And they yeah, say yeah. 25 different, you know, 30 different colors. And so for all for all of them, they say we found no link between red jelly beans and acne, P greater than 0.5, except for one of the colors where they say we found a link between the green jelly beans and acne, P is less than 0.05. And then the, the news in the next That's frame the is news the news headline, yeah. you know, jelly beans linked to acne, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, our, our our news cycle is problematic um, because uh, and this I one of the things people complain about in medicine is like you guys keep changing your mind. You know, you told us eggs were bad for you, and then then you told us eggs are good for us, and you, know, you said coffee's good for you, and then you said coffee's causes cancer, and then now it doesn't, and you know then drinking wine is prevents dementia, but oh no, any amount of alcohol is bad for your brain, but you know, and it keeps flip flopping, and like why don't you guys get your story straight and This is actually not because we keep changing our minds about the things that you're putting into your body. What this is an artifact of is that studies test the same hypothesis multiple times, sometimes in slightly different ways. But over time, there's going to be many studies that explore the link between alcohol use and cognitive function over time, because that's an interesting question that's very relevant. 
And every study is going to come up with a slightly different answer. And the way to understand the truth about alcohol use and cognitive decline is to synthesize all those studies and put them all together in some you know, statistically robust way. This is usually referred to as a meta-analysis and sort of say, we've taken all the data and this is the best, the state of our knowledge right now. But the media doesn't work that way. The media just looks at the most recent study and reports on that because that's what's new. That's the news, right? The new study. But each new study is really just moving the needle of evidence like a little bit one way or another. And so what you're getting is just kind of this, the last slice in the hypothesis train. And it can be very misleading because you'll, yeah, sure. You get one study that says eggs are bad for your heart. And then, you know, a year later, you get a study that says eggs are good for your heart. But you really can only figure it out if you combine the 100 egg studies over time um, to average out all the noise and stuff like that to get kind of a, a real estimate, which, by the way, is going to more or less tell you that eggs don't matter too much <laughs> um, in terms of heart disease. Yeah. So so you're out there, you're, you're fighting this good fight of, you know, promoting, I think, nuance and, and scientific literacy. Um, and I think it takes a lot of courage uh, for, for experts, you know, um, in a field to be willing to put themselves out there and, and, you know, sort of, I think, just do this public good of, um, you know, providing uh, a nuanced perspective. Um, you know, how has that been for you? I, I imagine you've been uh, the target of trolls to, to some extent. Somewhat. Yeah, I, I think other people have, have certainly, um, you know, I can't can compare with like the death threats and stuff that, you know, people like Fauci um, have gotten during the pandemic. And um, I do believe that, you know, um, although all public health officials make mistakes, you know, they really are doing the best with the information they have and what a, what a challenge that they had to face in the, in the face of this pandemic. But yeah, um, I get some, some angry comments, which is fine. Um, a couple disturbing emails that suggest that like, you know, I'm what's wrong with America right now. And again, for someone who I don't think I take very extreme positions, it's always like, oh, I, I you're angry at like me, like <laughs> little old me, you know, what did I say? Um, the most disturbing one, I can send you a screenshot actually. I got a letter in the mail um, in handwriting and it was just Bible quotes, but the theme of all the Bible quotes was death. Like it was all about, yeah. um, it was like quotes that had the word like die or like, you know, when you die, like blah, blah, blah. Like, so it was, it was actually, it was the creepiest one for some reason, because it was so vague. And I was like, am I reading into this? Like, is this, is this a threat or is it not? It was very strange. So there is that out there. And I think, you know, anyone who is facing the public in any way has to be prepared for that. And I sort of accept that. I, I will say like having kids and stuff, it, yeah. it, um, that's probably the part that like gives me the most pause is, is, you know, I would hate to think that anything that I do would ever adversely impact them. Yeah. I, I just thinking sort of, yeah, moving away from the personal aspect, but just more the, just the nature of this landscape of, of discourse, you know, I, I think what's very visible, very, very palpable is like this asymmetry of bullshit where someone who's tied to reality has to work with like the language of P value and has to work yeah. with like the language of nuance and conflicting studies and sample sizes um, is not, is not a very uh, compelling message. Whereas, you know, a conspiratorial mindset, which can talk in extremes, which can talk in a language of certainty um, is a much more compelling message. Um, and I think we see that in the discourse around COVID and discourse around vaccines. And, and also you mentioned in your book, just um, doctors, uh, patients prefer doctors that that offer certainty um, yeah. and high confidence. And that's not necessarily the best medical care for the patient. No, it's such a good point. And, and it's why debunking as sort of a as sort of a job is it's really blowing into the wind because it, it takes a split second to say something false but compelling and it takes way longer to explain it away for example i saw a viral tweet that was like oh um you want us to believe that they made an mrna vaccine you know for covid in under a year but um they couldn't make a vaccine for hiv in 30 years you know or whatever 
compelling. I get it. It's like, oh yeah, like why, why can't they make an HIV vaccine? Now there's an explanation for that. Um, number one, that HIV ha is a, is a different, completely different type of virus. It's a virus that has um, integrase protein in it, which means it can reverse transcribe its mRNA. So it has reverse transcriptase, which can convert its mRNA into DNA and integrase, which can integrate its DNA into the nucleus of your cell. So it can go completely inert. So your immune system can't see it and then pop out again later. And, co and uh, SARS-CoV-2 does not have reverse transcriptase, does not have integrase. It's a completely different type of virus. It doesn't have a latent phase like HIV. And I've already spent way more time explaining the difference than it took to write that tweet. And it's like a much different level of discourse. It's if you're not acting in good faith, if you're just like, I'm just going to say some shit, um, you can put out so much out there. It's like impossible to um, to counteract that, which is another reason why this like equal time narrative that you sometimes get from media. It's like, well, let's 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 you know, let's have the pro vaccine person on and the anti vaccine person on is not really fair because generally the pro vaccine person or the scientist is going to act in good faith. They're going to tell you, you know, what the data shows, what they have evidence to support. And if you have the other person who's going to make stuff up. Um, it's not equivalent because then the the scientist has to spend all their time saying, no, that's that's not right. Or I don't even know what you're referring to here or you're misinterpreting that. And it's it's this false equivalence that gives um, the impression that there's debate when there's really not. Uh, and, and I'm not sure how media organizations need to fix that, but at least they need to be aware of it. Yeah. You know, does medical school change you? You know, if a, a conspiracy theorist has, you know, one of the, the most absurd things about conspiracy theories of, you know, around medicine is the fact that there's just so much variety. So anyone, you know, when I lived on a medical scan, medical school campus, there was people from all walks of life, from every yeah. background, from every socioeconomic background, from every nationality, from every country. You know, I, I had meals with, with Palestinians and, you know, just people, I, I say that as someone like I never met a Palestinian before until medical school yeah, yeah, yeah. and like on and on, you know what I'm saying? And like, and just, you know, every political spectrum and, and there's a million fields of medicine and the idea that there's some sort of a conspiracy in medicine right, um, right, right. Is, is so is so absurd. But on, in your uh, second week of class, they pull you in and they're like, all right, here's the cure for cancer. Don't tell. Right. right. We're trying to make yeah, money. So, so you, we, we can we can laugh at that and we don't need to like to think about that. But 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 in a serious sense, like um, how does medical school change? How does being a doctor because being a doctor is such an, um, a unique, unusual a life choice where you're 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 dealing with human beings in a very raw way. You're dealing with people in their most vulnerable. You're dealing with death. Um, what what can you say yeah. about you know your experience? I know it's, I know we're coming to our end now. We're we're sort of almost out of time. That's okay. I, Just, you know, I mean it's yeah. It, yeah it's it's an incredible privilege. It's such an unusual job. Um, so there's all these things. You know we we are we have a greater degree of intimacy with our patients than like many people have with their spouses. You know, we, we will know things about our patients that they haven't told anyone potentially. Um, we see people at by far and away their most vulnerable, um, uh, you know, hospitalized, um, unable to make it to the bathroom. Like there, there are just states of humanity that, um, that most people never get to see. We also get exposed to death at an unnatural rate. Um, it was actually how it was described to me once uh, when I was in the intensive care unit. Um, and uh, we were getting a talk kind of about burnout and what they pointed out, which I hadn't thought about before is that like, when you live in a society, like deaths occur and they occur with some rate and like, we're built to tolerate that. We don't like it, but like we can recover from that. Um, but when you're sitting there in the ICU and you have, you know, a couple people dying every day, like that is an unnatural state of affairs. Like humans aren't supposed to necessarily see that. And of course, I mean, you've got wars and things like that where it happens, but it's not sort of the natural state of affairs. And so I think that does change you somewhat. Um, but of course it's this, I mean, it's a job where you, you feel like you're helping people, which is not something that I think a lot of people can say. Um, and uh, um, so I feel very, very lucky. Um, I have my frustrations with the system, but um, but not with not with the patients or the, that relationship. Yeah, there's, there's a lot more we can discuss. There's a lot more in the book um, that Always. is worthy of discussion. That you know, I'm, I'm cognizant of the time. Um, what what do you anything you want to sort of um, 
close with or, or just sort of uh, leave us with um, <laughs> as our time runs runs low here? Um, I, I, I was looking at like my, my sort of thoughts that I, I, I like people to, to think about. Um, I mean, I guess, uh, the, the two other big concepts that I, I want people to remember is that no one study is definitive. So, um, tell this to the students all the time. Studies can be interesting. They can be compelling. They can even be groundbreaking, but they're not definitive until they're replicated. Um, and if you just remember that you'll save yourself from going down a lot of hype holes, um, on the internet and elsewhere. Um, the other thing I want to remind people is that biologic plausibility doesn't mean something works. So I talk in the book a lot about this concept of biologic plausibility, which is, can I make a rational argument for why something I'm going to give to you or do to you or have you do is going to make you feel better? And I can often do that. And it may not be something that will actually make you feel better, that there's a difference between the plausible explanation and proof that it works. An example is like vitamin E. Vitamin E is an antioxidant vitamin. That is its purpose. It lives in plants to prevent the fats in plants from oxidizing in the presence of oxygen. Oxidate, you know, oxidant stress causes heart disease. I Therefore, it makes sense that taking vitamin E should prevent heart disease. I just gave you a good logical scientific explanation, biologic plausibility. Do the randomized trial, give half the people vitamin E, give half the people placebo, what happened? No difference in heart disease. In fact, slightly higher rate of heart failure in the vitamin E group, still unexplained. So just remember that just because someone online is trying to sell you something that makes sense, like, oh yeah, oxidants are bad. And like, oh yeah, this is an antioxidant. It does not mean it works. You need more definitive proof than that. That's my, that, those are my big, uh, big clues for uh, figuring out who to trust. Wonderful. Dr. Perry Wilson, thank you so much. Um, Thanks, Ami. This was fun.